Ben, are you still with Toronto? Yeah. You are still playing. Okay. Mm-hmm. How, how are you doing? I haven't even looked at your stats or anything. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just in extended right now just because I haven't pitched in like yeah. seven years. So yeah. <laughs> age-wise, like I'm 26, but like pitching-wise, I'm like 19. So I'm just like all the yeah. 19-year-old Latin. So they're kind of just like letting me like <laughs> – I think they're like, look, we're you're kind of in the like, not really pitched much Latin crew. Like honestly, like so we want you to like really get comfortable. Yeah. The stuff plays. It's just like you need to be comfortable pitching Every again. Yeah. yeah, and so like that cool. was. No, there's no, been no, a lot no. of things that like I've learned in terms of just like being in pro ball and like throwing repeatedly and like I think in training it's like you want to develop the nastiest stuff in terms of like the nastiest one pitch that you throw. Like you want to throw a pull down at 105 or you want to throw one fastball at like 98 or something. But then in pro ball, when you're having to pitch like multiple times a week as a reliever, it's like you can't just like throw one wiffle ball slider with 22 inches and then throw like three that suck. It's I'd rather throw one now that's like above average, but just throw it every time, throw it in the zone, throw the fastball in the zone. I don't know. There's just a lot of things that I've learned. Yeah. You feel like it's coach talk because like I've had a general distrust for most coaches because I've been kind of like the orphan child who's been like abused a little bit with my career, honestly, of like just how the dice have rolled. So it's like, I have like a pessimistic distrust of coaches. And so even like, I think with our coordinator first or who are like really, really awesome, like really good, really smart, really good dudes. They're trying to help me get to the big leagues. And it's like, look, dude, you just have to like learn to pitch consistently. And just like, not like we don't want you to have good stuff, but like your stuff's good enough. Just like throw it in the box and like learn to recover stuff like that. And like my mind is more like, well, well, I can fix this thing with my back leg or I can do this. And like, instead of like throwing 95, this pitch is going to be 98, which like grades out way higher. Like that. And it's like, well, yeah, but like you're going to one beat up your arm trying to make all these throws and changes. Like, it's just, it's a whole new game. You have to, yeah. You got to go out every day. And like you said, have that where it's like, oh, okay, well I'm just going to pitch today and I'm going to have a plus slider. It's just, it has to be there. Yeah. Instead of like when we're in the train, like you said, we're in the training environment where it's like, oh, well let me take the next three months to get my slider gross. It's like, no, you got to like, you got to sleep. You got to eat right. You got to have your throwing partner where you're working on your stuff and you're addressing your weaknesses and you have to show up every day and be that guy instead of yeah. like you should, like being a latin guy like yeah, yeah. And there's a there difference between pitching in a game yeah. and pitching in the lab oh 100 yeah. we yeah. as 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 we're starting to get used to all these numbers coming at us we always want to look at the numbers because that is objective feedback for us and we say okay i just threw a slider at 100 stuff and now i just threw a slider at 150 stuff plus i right. want to throw that 150 stuff plus more but in reality like you could you probably threw a pretty good slider at 100 at, you know, right. hundreds av- big league average, like a big league average slider is great. So, so good, I, I know a lot yeah. of guys who get beat up over that stuff. Yeah, a lot, a lot of guys get beat up. That. All right, we'll get into this stuff. We'll get into this stuff. Let me let me launch the show so we can get going. Runs one two on the way. Yeah, yeah. Welcome back to the Cova Sports Brick by Brick podcast. I'm your host, TJ Antone, pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds and owner at Cova Sports. Jeremy Kivel's also with us today, as always, head pitching guy at Cova Sports, training connoisseur. Guy knows it all. He's been through it all, been through all the injuries, and he's just really, really taking a dive off the deep end into the rabbit hole into training. It's just done really a really good job, you know, training guys and getting them better. Our special guest today is Ben Baggett. Ben Baggett, man, this guy has a crazy story. I read his blog post the other day. I read that really long blog post, Ben. It was really long. Really cool, though. I I appreciate you writing that. So I'll give you a quick synopsis. Ben was an absolute stud. Let me even back up further. Ben was just a typical freshman in high school, dove into training, started getting reading a little bit and wanting to know more about how does he get better. Was incredible his senior year. Most strikeouts in the state of Georgia. Am I right? Junior. Yeah. Went to Stanford and then just... 
was oh yeah, junior year. Yeah, because your senior year you missed because your foot Not hurt. Yeah, um, yeah. And then went to Stanford, was hurt all four years. Long story, and we'll get into all that. And then um, was, it was pretty much injured for seven years, and now he's in pro ball. He's pitching for the Toronto Blue Jays and their organization. So, man, Ben, welcome. We can't wait to hear some, about some of this stuff here, and just yeah. your journey, man. You know what what all is involved with that. You know, both of us have had Tommy John as well. And so, you know, it's just, I don't want to say it's a part of the game at this point, but a lot of guys do have to go through this and it's not fun. So I think a lot, you know, all three of us here can give some insight to just to not just injuries um, in general, but like in how to approach those, but you know, more specifically Tommy John and how to approach that. But Ben, welcome to the show. If you'd give us like a quick little synopsis of your like past five years, let's hear what you got. Ooh, past five years. What would that be back from age 21? So junior in college, blew out, winner before the year started tried to rehab didn't work tj missed most of my senior year grad transferred went to business school still dealing with some after effects from tj still hurt trying to push through it couldn't do it finished school up masters is about a two-year program mba and then ended up moving to Charlotte and coaching with my buddy, Ian Walsh, who's now with the Dodgers. And we were coaching high school and prep school age kids. So like kids, instead of going to college for freshman year, we were coaching them and coached together for about a year and a half up in middle of nowhere, North Carolina, and really just went into the rabbit hole of training and rehab myself, trained myself, started training guys remotely as well as in person, and then got picked up this winter by the Blue Jays and been with the Blue Jays now since December. Yeah, I love that. I love that like adversity drives you to like want to know more. And yeah. especially you've been you've through, been through a lot. So you had let me get see if I get all this correct. You had foot you, you broke your foot. Foot fracture. Right? Mm -hmm. Foot fracture. And then you signed at Stanford. R run us through like the, the sequence of events of uh, just like quickly. All right. Foot fracture, senior of high school, didn't heal, refractured, surgery, surgery failed, another surgery. That one took a while. Came back from that. Then a little bit of like just shoulder inflammation. Came back from that. Blew out the elbow. Rehab that. Complications from TJ. Just from them like not really moving the nerve so a lot of like nerve issues coming back from tj that lingered for a while try to rush back from that to try and get picked up the stress moved to the shoulder blew up the shoulder dealing with shoulder stuff off and on mostly on for like about a year and a half fixed the shoulder and now i'm where i'm at what changed so yeah, yeah i want to yeah, know i, I want to know like what was like okay kind of got this figured out Shoulders good, elbows good, foots good. Now I'm in Pro Bowl. It was it was honestly because it's it's tough when people look at the story because it's like, well, did you just break yourself? Like, ever, like was it just like? But the thing was like, I was never actually really like fully good. Like it was one into the yeah. next, and like one leads into this, which then leads into this, which leads into this. It's like I've mm -hmm. got a busted up elbow, and I'm trying to just push through it to get signed. Like I'm still putting the same amount of stress on my body. So like if the elbow is not going to take it, the shoulder is going to take over. And so then the shoulder would blow up. Mm -hmm. So, and then even back to the foot, it's like, I've read some studies where they talk about if you have a lower body injury, like a significant lower body injury, you have exponentially higher chances of dealing with an arm injury when you come back. Because I guess just with it being the, I mean, mine was my block, my plant foot. So when you plant, I'm sure you don't want to hit the block as hard. So some something yeah. up here is going to take the force. Yeah, you so it was almost and like you're, and you're just injured. So yeah, losing range of motion in the hip and all that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's plenty of reasons to where it's like, well, it was almost one into another into another because the longest period I had actually being healthy was about like 15, 16 weeks ish as a sophomore in college. Got back from my foot and was healthy for about 16 weeks and, and got almost like an, a 16-week off-season program with one of my buddies, like where we just let it eat. It was actually during the season. This is probably one of the most like where I learned the most. But, I mean, I was a sophomore at Stanford on the team. Had just gotten back, so like I wasn't going to pitch at all. Like every, Everything had been set. I am pitching two years. I'm not going to just like randomly be given chances to pitch and learn how to pitch in a Pac-12 game when coaches' jobs are on the line and you're trying to make a college world series, da-da-da. So I knew I wasn't going to pitch. 
So I got to show up to the field every day knowing like never going to pitch this year. Like it's done. And I'm like, I'm not waste. This time is not going to be wasted. I'm not going to sit here with my thumb on my butt and like, just be like, woe is me. But I'm also not going to be like, Oh, I'm, I'm just going to be here for the team and not do anything for myself and just like not actually get better. Like there's, it's not mutually exclusive. Like I can still be an awesome teammate for my boys, but I can still also get better. So on that hand, like it was pretty tough. Like it was honestly pretty embarrassing at times to know that I wasn't ever going to pitch that year and not travel and literally just train like a psycho with my other buddy who had been cut from the team who was going to grad transfer the next year. So, I mean, we're showing up. I mean, I'm showing up to games. And then instead of like being rushed with my throwing during the game, like I'll just wait until I, I'll sit and wait all game. I'll move around a little bit. And then I will long toss at 10 PM after the game from pole to pole, my buddy who would come after, or I'll show up at 11 AM before you know how that you got a seven o'clock game. Your day starts at like two o'clock. So like, I'm going to show up like I got my degree so I can say like, I'm going to skip class and show up at 11 AM because I know I can get my class stuff done after I know I can teach myself. I'm going to show up at 11. I'm going to lift and I'm going to throw and do all my stuff outside of that. And people are like, look, like, it's like, dude, why are are you doing this? It's like, because I know I'm not going to pitch. Like, I don't know what you want me to say. Like, it sucks, but it is what it is. And so I think the proudest moment for me was like, we were in the regional uh, playing Fullerton, like the regional college tournament. Uh, We hosted a regional and our baseball stadium is right next to our practice football fields. So three practice football fields, you can only carry 30 for the postseason in college. So five guys get left off the roster. It's normally there. Normally at that point you got five hurt guys. So like for me, like I'm not hurt, but like I was hurt. And so I'm like, well, I guess I could use the excuse of like, yeah, like I'm, well, I'm not on there cause I'm injured. It's like, dude, I'm not injured. I'm literally throwing at hundred percent, but I can't be in the dugout. I can't do any of this stuff. So like I need to get my velocity, like, I need to go long toss. Like I need to do stuff. So, I mean, there is literally games going on on the baseball field here and right next to it, you have another base, two other baseball players just in street clothes, just long tossing. And that was actually, uh, that was the first time I'd ever hit a hundred. Like it was on a pull down. Like, so when it's not the mount or anything, but, it was still, to me, it was a big milestone because on one hand, the embarrassment of like, I can't even be on the field with my own team is like pretty like tough to swallow, but you got to swallow it if you want to get better. Like, it, what else are you going to do? So now I only had one option. I was going to go next door. I was going to take my radar gun, going to take the speaker, and I was going to sling the rock because I knew what I wanted and it doesn't matter it didn't matter to me like how embarrassed or whatever you are. Like the only reason you're embarrassed is because you're worried about what all these other people are thinking. But like if you're not even worried about like what somebody who's walking by is wondering about two baseball guys throwing randomly while there's the regional championship going on next door, it's like, then you're just focused on you slinging the rock. And so that's what it, that was one of the biggest, I think, overall lessons that I learned that then set me up. I mean, granted, another f- four years after that were four years of injuries and roller coaster, but still that I think that 16 weeks of being healthy and having to get over myself was the biggest thing that helped down the road. Yeah, I think you did a really good job of redirecting your your self pity and, you know, like not being able to do what you love and it fueled your training. Yeah. And especially during that moment. And you said, which you said, I, I agree with you hundred percent. You said that was my only choice. That was the only thing I could have done. Well, in reality, you could have done anything. You could have gone home and played video games. You know what I'm saying? Oh, what was me? Maybe next year uh, I can train in the off season. You could have done anything, but you were so dedicated to the game and so dedicated to your craft that you went and you did either at 11 AM when it wasn't convenient, 10 PM when it wasn't convenient for you. Like it, it, I think a lot of people need to know that like to get to the next level, to get to professional baseball, it's not just this, 
oh, I just need to throw hard enough and I'll get there. Like it is a yeah. full life dedication of like every living, breathing moment. Like right now, like I'm drinking a Gatorade with electrolytes in it because I want to be hydrated for my, my training tomorrow. It's just every little decision is made around trying to be at your best when it's time to go. And a lot of people don't understand. It's like the, the full encompassing day-to-day, moment-to-moment decisions of, of making decisions going towards your end goal. Kind of like what we right. talked about last, last time, Kibble. It's like, keep the end goal in mind. Yes, we want to be in the big leagues again. But like these moments here like matter. Every decision you make along the way matter. So you feel like that was like one of your biggest things you've learned through like your injuries is like just the dedication or what do you feel like, like, what do you think like the key thing was that you learned from all of your injuries kind of cumulatively? I think the, the one thing was like with the end goal, my dad is super goal driven and he's kind of passed that on to me to where I think I had, I had this set in my mind of like, all right, play in the big leagues. So like, well, what does that look like? Well, it probably looks like throwing 95 plus and it probably looks like punching a lot of dudes out so like how do you how do you get there and then every decision everything i did was just about maximizing whatever i could do to get there so if that meant that like when my foot was broken that i couldn't throw with my legs like on my legs like i went out and long toss for my knees every day like i took a bucket of balls put them in the back of my jeep left high school early, drove over the field to our uh, football field or our practice field. I threw the bucket on my crutches. I crutched out. My dad got me some volleyball knee pads, got on my knees and just slowly threw them, threw them, emptied the bucket, crutched, picked them up, brought them back, did it again. Just did it every day. I like just same thing, Upper only lifted upper body and then reversed that with the elbow. It was like just did whatever I could do. And so everything was, was just about whatever you have at your disposal and whatever resources, tools, abilities that you have, you can't use one of your arms, you can't use one of your legs. Well, then use the other three. Do use them to like maximize what you have now. I think that's a good point, especially for a lot of kids. <clears throat> this day and age with social media and all the information flying around, that kind of was one of the questions that I had. And I, I know that you address this on social media as well, as far as like whatever the specificity is inside of the training, like this works, this doesn't work, that work, this works, mobility work, you know, bench, don't bench, like throw, do pull downs, don't do pull downs. It's really like having that desire of like, okay, well, I'm going to do this and you're going to get more benefit from maybe not doing the perfect thing from going about it a certain way or right. having that just internal drive where it's like, yeah, I can do a pull, I can do a pull apart or I can do a pull apart, like not playing for three years. And like, I want this and I want to be on the field and it hurts. Right. Doing it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I, I think that that is very important that that intent the intention um, and the desire and having it being uh, connected to like what you're doing goes a lot longer or a lot further than, than what you're actually doing sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially I think like getting it to, I mean, there is like, we talked about a little bit earlier before we started is like, there is a little bit different jump from doing it in training to doing it in a game. And so like, if we are supposed to, yeah, it's cool to do it in training, but it's way cooler to do in a game. Like I'd rather throw 92 and punch tickets in a game than throw 100 in training and never get to the game. So if the whole point is getting it into the game, then that's what you have to be about and driving you. And so I think that's like a huge jump for people because you see a lot of guys that can just ball in training. They throw hard in training. They can do crazy stuff with their body. They're strong, but – like, do they have the actual, like, they want to go kill in a game? And if you don't have that, I don't think it's going to yeah. translate, honestly, at the end, yeah, to not, the fullest extent. Yeah, not only the don't or, like, you know, go kill, but, like, that's something – that's another thing that I've made adjustments with with a lot of the guys that we're training is it's like, you, you know, you have, like, the PR culture and, you know, pull downs and, you know, broad jump 11 feet and, like, mm-hmm. bench press 500. It's like, yeah, but, like – sixth inning like can you execute a breaking ball right the three hole and get ahead of it's like i know that 
from my experience, that is, you're going to be in that situation and nobody cares about your broad jump. That's a means to like, you know, maximizing your potential and you want to go hard in training, but like right. at the end of the day, like, are you getting the guy out? And that's something that I put more focus in with the players. Like, you know, taking a little bit of maybe velo away for a more advanced guy if he's already throwing hard and like, hey, like, can we have your plus pitch more often? And can you throw it for a strike and can you throw it for a ball? That's more of a focus for this player. Now, yeah. if you're like, if you're like a younger guy and you throw 65, it's like, hey, man, like, let's just be crazy for a while and like see what happens because you just you're not going to throw hard enough right now to, to have any sort of chance to, you know, play at a high level. So. Yeah. And yeah. Kivel, you went the other day, you went to a couple of our kids' high school games. And I remember you came back and you were like, we need to change a few things. We need to change kind of the way we're going about it because this kid is great in the gym. And I went and watched his game the other day and he, you know, he did X, Y, and Z. You know, I need to change. I want to make sure he executes that pitch on O2. I need to make sure he knows how to execute that pitch O2. Like a lot of those things you don't talk about. When we're training, you know, we're trying to develop the slider. We're trying to develop the curveball. We're trying to develop the fastball. We're trying to develop the athlete, the human capabilities of being a human. Mm -hmm. But like you also have to develop the, the know how and what to do and how to do it. And there's a really good mix there because it does matter. But again, like we always talk about, it's fun to post the kid who makes a seven mile an hour gain. So it's fun to push that. But at the right. same time, it's also Kivel talked about this the other day. It's a lot more fun to be like, hey, this is the kid we work with, and he was pitcher of the year and is at a school, and this is the kid we worked with, and he had a low ERA all year. Maybe right. he doesn't throw 95. Maybe he throws 88. But that's great because 88 in the pitcher of the year is a lot better than 95 in a training environment. Right. Exactly. When you exactly. go, I mean, going back to yeah. that is like, what's the biggest thing that you like learned is like, I mean, in terms of like mentally overcoming adversity, that was just embracing the misery and like just enjoying the misery is the, is the biggest thing. Like emotionally, I think that I've learned is like just loving it, loving being miserable, like as bad as that sounds. The other well, part that took me to the actually getting back to playing again is what we just talked about. And it's like when you're trying to maximize what you have and you can't play, you forget what it's like to play and you forget that that's what you're about. And so like in high school for me, I would go to the gas station before every practice and go eat a slushy, two donuts and a pack of candy. Like horrible. Like I didn't really care. Like I lifted a lot, but like it wasn't that big a deal to me. It's like, ah. Uh, I'll go lift because, like, I'm getting stronger. Like, I'm really strong and explosive. But, like, I wasn't obsessed with it. I was obsessed with, like, oh, I'm, I'm pitching on Friday. Like, I'm going to just punch out 18 in six innings. That's what I was obsessed with. And so when that got taken away and for so long and all I could do was just train, 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 the physical qualities, that became how I deemed successful. So, like – did my squad go up? Did my vertical go up? Did my broad go up? My bench go up? Was I doing all these things physically? And that's what I deemed successful. And I think that got me into that training rut. I guess that you get too far into the training side and you forget that the whole point is to go enjoy playing. And so being yeah. around Ian and being around a ton of high schoolers again, like a bunch of idiot high schoolers who like, don't give a rat's like drink a milkshake before a lift, like just like having fun and like, well, the lifts are like cool. It's fun to lift, but like the only reason we're lifting is because we want to go like strike everybody out and like dominate in games. So like seeing all those kids do it, being with some pro guys that were like the same way is like, I'm not really obsessed with like just benching the house today because like, I just want to bench the house and I need to get stronger or else it's like, I'm, I'm just doing this so I can throw gas and be healthy. And so like when that flipped, I started enjoying it more. I started not having to rely on doing certain things. Like we just traveled for seven hours, uh, taking a kid on a visit. I haven't even drinking like much. I haven't taken caffeine. I like, haven't drink coffee. I haven't done anything. It's 8 p.m. at night and I'm going to go in and like move around real quick and then throw. And then I throw and my arm doesn't fall off. It's like, wait. I didn't do all these things. Like I didn't even train very hard. Like, did I get, it's like, no, you did like you, it's, 
And so that's when it really started to click. Going towards the actual competition and what it takes to be a professional baseball player and what you see the yeah. best do in terms of the big leagues, it's like it's 162 games. Like DJ, you know, you've done it plenty of times. It's like you got to be ready to go. Like you, your body has to be ready to go. That's the sport. The sport isn't showing up in training and PR and once a week. It's getting guys out consistently yeah. for 162 games. Yep, and you it's good to have that perspective as a coach. And, like, I hope you play for a long-ass time, Ben, but, like, when you come back out of the game, you're going to have that. And, right. you know, I I did two-and-a-half extendeds, so, like, I've been there before. You know, it's it's good to have that perspective. But it's, it's almost like our body's going to, you know, naturally, like, externally, we're going to get into the environment we need to be in. When you're a high schooler and you're chasing results on the field – and you're hyper focusing on that, then you're probably not getting something else. And maybe that was the training, maybe that was the diet, maybe that was the sleep. Um, but guess what? For the next five years or whatever, you had to be in that environment. And then you learned, like, right. okay, well, I need to get stronger. I need to get my sleep right. But if I just hyper focus on those things, then I'm not really worrying about results in the game. And then right. that puts you back. Now you're now you're in the correct environment, but you've put the pieces together. Where it's like, I'm addressing this, I'm addressing this. The example you just gave, okay, I'm just going to move around so I get the blood flowing and I feel good so I can go execute sliders tomorrow or like feel good to throw my pin tomorrow in front of my coaches or like whatever it is. It's funny how that works. And it's that process that you've committed to. And it's cool to see those those dots start to connect for you, but you're still like in the game and you have a chance. So that's, that's a dangerous uh, man right there. I think I think it's a dangerous man right there if you if you keep going. So especially with your stuff. I've seen you throw, so you got good stuff. I appreciate that. It's gonna play. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ben, second question. How important is the environment you're in versus you're doing in the environment? So like we talked about earlier, you know, doing a pull apart or doing a pull apart. So how yeah. important is it to be in that environment versus actually like being in that environment? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's kind of the biggest thing that I'm looking for in terms of like this off season is like trying to get a bunch of, not a bunch of dudes together, but get 10, 15, just psychos together. Like guys that have, have trained a little bit or a lot, but just like want to just get after it because being around those guys is going, is what's going to make you better. Like, if you're in a gym with 400 pound bench pressers and you bench 200, you're not going to bench 200 pounds that much longer. Like you look at Westside, right. I think Westside Barbell is one of the coolest places ever. And like, is Westside Barbell because is Westside Barbell Westside Barbell because of the conjugate method that they used and exactly every specific rep scheme and exercise and how they did the exercises, or is it because there was 20 lunatics who belonged in prison together just training like psychos <laughs> four times a week. I love it. I think it's, yeah, I, I don't think yeah. like, it's like, oh, uh, well you can have, if you have the best environment and then everyone just runs eight miles a day, we're going to throw harder because we all want to throw harder and pushing each other. It's like, well, no, but if you Probably have like the best program ever and you're just kind of training by yourself, like, and eh, this is okay. Like, it's not neither. Neat, both suck. So, yeah, I would, I would like to say that, like, I mean, I'm looking for like an environment at this point because, like, especially, it's hard because you get so many guys in high school and college who haven't trained, and it's like, well, these guys like need a little bit of like they need the to get introduced to training the right way. They need to kind of know what they're doing and they'll see a lot of like beginner gains. But I think when you're talking more of like, like if we were all training together, like I don't think we would need to sweat over what kind of programming we're getting. I think it would be way more like the programming is the programming, like the mm -hmm. training with absolute psycho intent with the right exercises is where the money is made. But, but That's I think magic. like That's the magic. for so long, I was so caught up on like, I think probably because I was hurt of like, well, is this exercise better than this exercise here? Because I need to accomplish this goal. And, 
oh, I also need to hit this. So like I need to include this exercise and this and this. And I think that's like the, that's the double edged sword of like being a coach and having a coach's mind and like having Mm -hmm. knowledge is, you know, that there's so many good things that you can do and so many things that need to be accomplished with the body that you combine all this stuff. And then the cake sucks. Like the ingredients were good, but the cake is awful because like Mm -hmm. you focus so much on like including all these different ingredients that you weren't worried about the actual cake. And then it sucks Mm -hmm. and no one wants a bad Mm -hmm. cake. You a hundred percent spot on. That's a really, that's a really good analogy. That that's me right there too. I've been down that before where it's like, ah, let's do this and do some plyometrics. Let's do some max effort work. Let's do some, uh, some over speedy centric. Let's do this. Let's do yeah. that. We all need these actions. And then exactly. it's like, yeah. this is too much. And like, I'm not even having fun anymore. Exactly. Uh, it's not let's go do something else. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's a really good analogy. I like that a lot. But so like with talking about making a great cake, so what are some things that, because, you know, we do this podcast, you know, a lot of kids and a lot of parents listen to this. What are some things that like you would give advice to kids or parents, you know, for their kid? What are some specific things that, you know, they can work on that would kind of like help them get to go in the direction that they want to go and guessing that everyone wants to play professional baseball or be better at baseball. What should be in the cake? What should be, what should be in the cake? I think the cake, I think tell us your ingredients. I think the give us your special ingredients is figuring out what kind of cake you even want because you I I have athletes who will text me about oh should I do this or should I do this like should I play summer ball should I train should I transfer should I do this and I'm like well what do you want like for like I can't tell you what to do like you have to be the one to decide because you know what you want like if you want to be a great high school pitcher and then go to the like state university and join a frat, then like you should probably like train a little bit, lift a little bit, long toss, and then just go pitch, like go hang out with your boys, go hang out with girls in high school. Like, but if you want to play college ball, do you want to play professional baseball? Do you want to just throw as hard as possible? Like there's all these different things. And I think, a lot of people don't want to sit down with themselves and figure out what they actually want and not only figure out what they want, but figure out where they're objectively at. And it's like, it's so hard to be objective with yourself. Um, and I think like, that's where my, my dad was, was super helpful of like just sitting down. It's like, dude, you throw like 79 miles an hour. Like if you want to go play in college, like you're going to have to throw 90. And I get you're only 15 as a freshman, but like that's just not going to cut it. Like you just wrote down that you want to go to Stanford, Vanderbilt, or some other SEC school. Well, like go watch the TV. They're all throwing 93. So you're not going to be able to go. Like they're not going to give you the time of day. So all these people, I think, don't even know what they actually want. And they're too afraid to sit down with themselves and look in the mirror and see where they're actually at. And so, like, people complain about Perfect Game being, like, a scam and stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, it is. But it's also, like, it's an objective measuring stick. Like, if you go Mm -hmm. to Perfect Game and you throw 81 on the mound, it says it right there. Like, and you know how many times, like, I'll get a text that's like, new athlete, oh, yeah, like, I've been up to 87. Like, you look at their Perfect Game, it's like they've – Touch they're 79 to 80, touch 80, 82. It's like, you're not, you're not 87. You're just not. And so until you can sit down and just accept the fact that you suck and sucking is not going to get you there, then it's like training's cool. But you, if you train really hard and you're that 80 mile an hour guy and you get to 84, 85, that's awesome. That's a five mile an hour jump, Mm -hmm. but you think you throw 87 and you're throwing 85. Like mentally that's going to be awful for you. It's like, wait, I'm throwing 85 on the gun, but I throw 87. No, I do. It's like, no, you don't. Kibble and I can think of one specific person that that this, they have that problem. They have that problem where it's like, they like one gun somewhere. Some dad thought he had saw an 87 on the gun. 
And just for the rest of his career, he was stuck that like he was regressing yeah. because he was training with us and not throwing 87. And it's like that object, we're giving you objective feedback. We have two $2,500 stalker radar guns right here. Like they ain't lying to you, brother. Like right. I throw on them. <laughs> so, you're, you're 78, my guy. Yeah. And that's not going to play. You're training like that and you think you're regressing and you're just going to get in a spiral. Like you're going to get in a exactly. spiral. But I think. Oh, I'm 87. No. Yeah. And then. In terms work of somebody. Like physical aspect, it's like, I mean, you could put it simple of like get really strong, be able to move your body and throw well. And then I, I think like the biggest, like the three things of like throwing hard is like, okay, we need to either put more force into the baseball. We need to put the same amount of force over greater ranges of motion, or we need to just produce the force faster. Those are the mm-hmm. three things. If you just focus on those three things, that's really all, all throwing is, is putting as much force into the baseball towards home plate as possible. So if the three mm-hmm. things that make that up are putting force into it quicker, putting force into it through deeper ranges of motion, or putting more force into the baseball, if you cover those three, then... That's really all there is. And so when you talk about putting more force into the baseball, that's it's just getting stronger, getting more explosive. I think moving, like being moving in good advice, position to like, put, put the force into putting it. Putting yeah. force into the baseball towards the plate. So that's just movement efficiency. You got all these pieces going everywhere. It's not going to be throwing us hard as someone who's just right out the chute. Mm-hmm. Putting force through greater ranges of motion is just essentially mobility being able to get into deeper positions and then just moving faster um which is a combination of movement efficiency and it's really just movement efficiency honestly yeah yeah it's, yeah it's like big it's what are the big ingredients it's movement yeah. efficiency strength and power and movement options I yeah guess. exactly yeah. oh I, th- I think that's good like i think it's a really good piece of advice for players or parents just like what kick do you want to bake you know what i'm saying like yeah there's there's so many different cakes that we can bake. Uh, you know, me and Kibble always talk about, you know, I want kids to reach their highest potential. It, whether your potential is playing varsity baseball or pitching in the big leagues, I want to help you reach your highest potential. And I think some kids just need to recognize that. Like, what is my highest potential? Like, what do I want to do with my ability? And dude, playing in high school, playing on varsity, that's, it's so, it's fun. I I have so many good memories from that. And if my right. playing career ended right there, like that'd be, that's completely fine because like you can go on in life and do be successful in other things. But I think some of these things that we're talking about, one, it helps in other ways in other areas of life because it helps you, you know, essentially develop a goal, have a goal and develop a plan to, to achieve your goal. Right. And it helps you develop hard work and, and consistency and work ethic. A lot of the kids just come in, they don't know about consistency. They don't know about work ethic and we have to teach them some of that stuff. And it's great. I love it. I love when a kid comes in, he's never even like been in the weight room before, or never done any sort of training, you know, three, two, three, four, five times a week. Like he's never been consistent with anything. And he finally comes in for an off season and trains with us for four months. And it's like, whoa, I, you know, did I increase my velocity? I feel better. I'm stronger. I'm jumping further. And then they take those gains into the, into the game where it actually matters and they're doing better. And they're like, what? Like, and it's not like we have this, you know, specific, you know, formula. Like, yeah, there's some cool things that we, that we do specifically that we like. And every other gym in the whole world can say the same thing. Right. But like it does not, it's not, it doesn't matter. Like none of the little secret formulas matter. It's yeah. it's like consistency, hard work. And then like what Kivel always says, developing your weak spots and then just going out there and doing it, man. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's just like the simple way of getting better at what you like. Ben, mm-hmm. it was a pleasure. I know that was like really fast, but we covered a lot of stuff. One thing, one last question I want to ask you is if you could give yourself your, your younger self advice based on where you're at now, looking back and give your, probably your junior year self right before you got injured, what would you say to yourself? I think instead of always looking towards the next step and like what you can do next, what you can do next, what you can do next in comparing everything like oh i throw this hard this got those this hard oh i do this he does that just focus on the here and now and and where you're at and enjoy it and like make the most of like what's right here i think a lot of it was was perfect game the rankings all that stuff was coming out that's a big deal in high school 
uh, mm-hmm. who's going to get – who's getting drafted, who's ranked higher. The same thing in college. I mean, it's the same exact thing in college. It does not yeah. stop in high school. It's like, well, this scouting – this they have this guy here. He throws this hard. Like, I want to throw that hard. It's like – Super comparison. I mean, it happens in pro ball too. I'm sure. Like you got yep. that guy at eighteen. I did it. Like that guy's a prospect. Well, I do this. Like this is this. Like you're looking towards the next step, and then comparing where you need to, where you want to be with what that is or whatever, versus just looking where you're at now and maximizing what you are now, and just enjoying. And I think that Love is that. going to that is going to like trampoline you to where you need to be far more than you sitting there doing the comparison mode. Do you feel like you're yeah. lacking something versus realizing what makes you you and why you're good? I think that's 100%. That's probably what saying. 100%. Yeah. Money. Enjoy the moment. Moment to moment matters, man. Well, Ben, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Guys, go follow him on Instagram uh, at Built by Baggett. I love that Instagram name. I appreciate <laughs> it. Because you are. You're built by yourself. You know what I'm saying? Also, go follow Ian Walsh, too. I'll give him a shout out. I like looking at his page. Uh, that's yeah, Ben's stuff. friend. Yeah. The mad science. Yeah, really. They got really good stuff. Actually, I actually heard about you guys from uh, Eric Jagers, which is our uh, assistant my boys. Uh, pitching coach. Great, dude. He's so smart. I got to get him on here next, man. But yeah, hey, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, su- subscribe here on YouTube. Like this video. Send this to people if you think it would uh, help them in their journey on their journey to the big leagues or journey to whatever they want to be great at. Guys, thank you so much again. Jeremy, Ben, y'all have a wonderful day. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, guys.